where we can introduce the former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull who joins us now in the studio. Thank you so much for being here. Your personal reflections on this morning? Well, it's a morning of great sadness, I think, for all of us, uh, for Australians, for millions of people around the world. Lucy and I went to bed last night with dread and we woke up in grief. Uh, the Queen was an extraordinary presence for all of our lives. She's been so dignified, so devoted to service, uh, and, you know, at a personal level, uh, so engaging. So when we met with her, she was char charming and calm, put us at our ease, keenly interested in all the affairs and personalities of the day, absolutely not going through the motions, absolutely not on the talking points, but wanted to know what I thought, and then when Lucy joined us, what she thought about the big issues of our times, geopolitical issues, planning issues, urban issues. Uh, really, she was as well informed and as keenly interested in my views as an Australian Prime Minister as any British Cabinet Minister I met. And we keep hearing that, that she was so across her brief, so mm. across world events, who leaders were, who their parents were. She would, if someone came to her and said that they were having a problem in X country, she would say, oh, I met their father, however long ago. And she was just very much across that. Did you also get a sense of her sense of humour? Because we've been hearing about that as well. Yes, yeah, sure. she was very droll. I Look, I, 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 I'll keep the discussion to, uh, you know, maybe for history, for later, but today, yes, I'd say she's very, very, uh, very droll, very good sense of humour and, and a disarming sense of humour that puts you at your ease. You know, I mean, she, she understood better than anyone what a, an awesome uh, experience it was for people to go to Buckingham Palace, to see the Queen, to be in the presence of somebody that's been part of their lives for, for all their lives. And so she was really good at putting you at her ease. She, she had charm and calm. And that was a very formidable and effective combination. What place did Australia and Australians hold for the Queen? Well, look, she, she always showed a great interest in Australia and I think in all of her realms, but in the Commonwealth as well. You know, the, the Queen is not the, was not the head of state of most Commonwealth countries. Uh, she's not the head of state of India and again, but most, about 60%, maybe a little more now, of Commonwealth countries do not have the Queen as head of state. And she was as interested in the countries which were part of the Commonwealth, in my experience anyway, uh, as she was in those of which she was formerly the head of state. I'd be interested to hear um, what, how she managed that relationship between the monarchy and government, because of course the Queen worked with 16 Australian Prime Ministers and 15 British Prime Ministers to have uh, a reign that went all the way from Churchill to, to Truss, is mm -hmm. an extraordinary arc. Mm -hmm. um, what did you notice about the way that she transcended that role and the way that she operated? Well, look, ab above all, she was the Queen of the United Kingdom. Now, the only reason she was the Queen of Australia was because our Constitution says the Queen means Queen Victoria and her heirs and successors and the sovereignty of the United Kingdom. So, yes, she was the Queen of Australia, but she was a very act. She, she was she was not active in our government. I mean, there were occasions. Obviously, the dismissal in 1975, when she was brought into it, or, or in, was sought to be brought into it. But you know, ultimately, the role of the monarch, of the head of state in Australia, is fulfilled by the governor general, as it is in Canada and New Zealand, and so forth. But in the UK, she's very involved. I mean, she sees the prime minister every week. And, and is very, and, and you know, she gets her red boxes and, and all of the uh, items, legislation, regulations that need royal assent, she would give. So she is, she is her, her role in the UK is very different to her roles such as it was in Australia. The, the interaction between the British Parliament 
and the monarchy is one that's historically very fraught, right? There's been some extremely yeah. dark moments. So mm. her role has been um, an, a deeply diplomatic one, hasn't it, over the last 70 years? Yes, she is. I, I think she embodies uh, a, a sort of in, an instinctive conservatism. Now, you know, most people in politics in Australia, let alone in the United States, who call themselves conservatives wouldn't know the difference between Edmund Burke and Tony Burke. And uh, the Queen was a natural conservative. She understood the importance of institutions and traditions, uh, and so she defended them. But she also understood that they, ha because they are living things, they have to grow and develop in an organic way and change with the times. But they've got to change in a way that preserves the institution and does not undermine it. And I think she handled that transition. If you think of the way the world has changed in the 70 years of her reign, there has never been a period in human history where the pace and scale of change has been so rapid and substantial. And she's, she's been a constant presence throughout that, and she's managed to keep the monarchy in place. Now, that's no mean feat, because remember, the Queen is re related to m or pretty much all of the crowned heads of Europe. And in her lifetime, and in particular in her parents' lifetime, so many of those monarchs and princes and archdukes have been deposed. So just keeping the show afloat and keeping it going, keeping it relevant, keeping it loved has been a great achievement.